Welcome to NTD News. I'm Kevin Hogan. Here are today's top stories. A ninth shooting victim dies after yesterday's shooting in San Jose, California. What do neighbors have to say after finding out they lived next to the suspected gunman? The Senate passes a bill calling on the Biden administration to declassify intel on the Wuhan lab. A GOP senator says intelligence agencies need to tell the public what they find after a deep dive into the origin of the virus. A group of Republican state treasurers warn they will pull assets out of banks that refuse to work with certain industries. They accuse the Biden administration of pressuring the banks, saying it harms the free market and everyday Americans. Their assets together valued at $600 billion. Senator Tom Cotton fired off some strong words at Democrats after they threatened to expand or change the Supreme Court. A ninth victim has died after the shooting in San Jose, California, Wednesday morning. He was in critical condition, but later passed away at the hospital. NTD's Jessica Beatty reports. Nine lives cut short in San Jose, California, Wednesday. The ninth victim died after arriving at the hospital. Earlier, authorities released the names of eight people killed during a morning shift change at the Valley Transportation Authority rail yard. Also dead is the accused gunman. Authorities say he shot himself. Media identified him as 57-year-old Samuel Cassidy, a maintenance worker at the yard. Before the shooting, he reportedly set his own house on fire. A neighbor saw the blaze around 6.40 a.m. and captured it on his cell phone. Yes, I met him a couple of times. He's kind of a little mean. He doesn't talk too much. He's kind of quiet. And uh, every time I say hi, he ignore me. He's looking at me. He's trying to look. He's looking at me all the time. He's trying to look at me. So I never talked to him. Another neighbor also saw the commotion around 7 a.m., but didn't realize the connection until later. But then uh, my wife turned on the TV, and from the media, we learned wow. what happened. And the connection between uh, what had happened at the, with the site where those people were unfortunately killed and the home site here. When asked if having such a local connection frightened him. Of course, yeah. You know, that would scare anybody on any neighborhood uh, because you... I mean, I, like, uh, I walk here almost every other day around this corner right here. And I mean, who's going to think of that uh, something like this could happen? The suspected gunman's ex-wife told AP he had talked about killing people at work over a decade ago. But she never believed him until now. President Biden ordered flags to be flown at half-mast, and he asked Congress to act on legislation to curb gun violence. Authorities are still trying to figure out a motive. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. Around the same time the California rail yard shootings happened, the U.S. Senate held a hearing for Biden's nomination to head the ATF. Nominee David Chipman, who currently serves as a policy advisor to a gun violence prevention group, said he supports banning one of the most popular rifles, the AR-15. NTD's Lin Lin reports. David Chipman is President Biden's pick to lead the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, or ATF. At Wednesday's nomination hearing, Chipman said he supports a ban on AR-15s. With respect to the AR-15, uh, I support uh, a, a ban. The AR-15 is one of the most popular guns in America, with over 40 years of history. The National Rifle Association estimates there are some 8 million AR-15-style rifles in circulation. The letters AR stand for its original manufacturer, Armalite Rifle, and not for assault rifle or automatic rifle. Across the U.S., seven states and Washington, D.C. have laws banning assault weapons. But Senator Tom Cotton says this term is created with a political agenda. That there really is no such thing as an assault weapon. That is a term that was manufactured by liberal lawyers and pollsters in Washington to try to scare the American people into believing that the government should confiscate weapons. Chipman worked at the ATF for 25 years. After retirement from the bureau, he actively advocated for tougher gun laws. During the hearing, Republican senators quoted a political report saying President Biden's son, Hunter Biden, lied about his drug addiction on a gun purchase background check. When asked if Hunter Biden should be prosecuted, Chipman said he would not give any political favor. I will ensure that all violations of law are investigated and referred. Um, I'm not sure that it has not been investigated. 
The ATF director's seat has always been politically fraught. The Senate has confirmed just one nominee in the last 15 years. Most have been acting directors. Lin Lin, NTD News. Senate Republicans are expected to block a bill on Thursday. If passed, it would create a commission to investigate the Capitol breach earlier this year. The, already, the, the House already passed legislation to create a bipartisan panel of 10 people tasked with figuring out what happened when protesters entered the Capitol on January 6th. Five people died as a result, and about 140 police officers were injured. 35 Republicans crossed the aisle to join Democrats in passing that bill, 252 to 175. But the Senate is a different story. Republicans there say Democrats want a commission so they can use it as a political tool in the 2020, mid, 2022 midterm elections. Though the Democrats can generally push partisan bills through the Senate with Vice President Kamala Harris's tie-breaking vote, Republicans are expected to use a filibuster to block a vote from taking place. The Biden administration is one step closer to being forced to declassify all U.S. T intelligence related to the origin of the CCP virus or coronavirus. And that includes what happened at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It comes amid calls for a new probe into the origin of the virus. Here are the details. A bill involving the origin of the CCP virus passed the Senate Wednesday night unanimously. It requires the Director of National Intelligence to declassify all American intelligence on the alleged links between the Wuhan Institute of Virology and the origin of the virus. Republican Senator Josh Hawley introduced it and Senator Mike Braun co-sponsored it. Look at what our country has gone through. Been a year and a quarter and it has ravaged not only the United States, but the world. And why, in the sake of like simple transparency, wouldn't we want to get to the root cause of it? If the bill becomes law, it may declassify documents on the Wuhan lab in connection with the People's Liberation Army. Also, any research on coronaviruses at the Wuhan lab prior to the outbreak. This comes as new calls for a probe into the origin of the CCP virus ramp up. That's as concerns grow about the possibility of the pandemic starting from a lab accident. HHS Secretary Javier Becerra called for the WHO to launch a transparent second phase of the investigation. That was at the 74th World Health Assembly. Phase two of the COVID origin study must be launched with terms of reference that are transparent, science-based, and give international experts the independence to fully assess the source of the virus and the early days of the outbreak. Senator Braun told Fox News he questioned Dr. Fauci on why the U.S. would turn to the WHO for answers on the origin of the virus. The WHO parroted CCP talking points at the time of the outbreak, such as denying human-to-human -human transmission and calling it racist to consider that the virus originated in China. Braun also questioned why the U.S. would rely on the Chinese communist regime for answers, given the CCP's lack of transparency. The Biden administration is enhancing pipeline security after the colonial pipeline hack. Pipeline companies will now be required to report confirmed or potential cyber attacks to the, to the Department of Homeland Security within 12 hours. The decision makes a shift from the current voluntary system of reporting. DHS officials say the new mandate also requires companies to designate a 24-7 cybersecurity coordinator to liaison with the government. 100 of the most critical pipelines are impacted by the new requirement, including the Colonial Pipeline, which was paralyzed by a ransomware attack about two weeks ago. The company had to shut down operations, causing gas shortages in parts of the southeast. A group of Republican state treasurers warned the Biden administration not to undermine key industries in their states. They say the administration is engaged in a misguided attempt to cancel the fossil fuel industry in the U.S. Fifteen state treasurers fire off a letter to John Kerry warning him that their states will pull assets out of banks that target the fossil fuel industry. They cite reports that Kerry and other members of the Biden administration are privately pressuring banks not to lend to and invest in oil, gas and coal companies. Kerry is the Biden administration's special presidential envoy for climate. The treasurers say it's not the job of government officials to control legal activities in the free market economy. They write, as a collective, we strongly oppose command and control economic policies that attempt to bend the free market to the political will of government officials. 
They say that the industries are critical to the U.S. economy and the livelihoods of families that work in them. And pressuring the banks to harm certain sectors of the economy goes against American values. They write, it is simply antithetical to our nation's position as a democracy and a capitalist economy for the executive branch to bully corporations into curtailing legal activities. They say it is not up to the Biden administration to pick economic winners and losers, and that amounts to taking away the freedom and choices of the American people. The treasurers say that the Biden administration is going after critical industries in their states based on radical political ideology, and they'll respond if they have to by pulling funds from the banks that comply. According to Axios, the signees of the letter collectively represent more than $600 billion in assets. Senator Tom Cotton is taking issue with Democrats on Twitter for threatening to make changes to the Supreme Court if it rules to let states limit abortions. Republican Senator Tom Cotton is accusing Democrats of blackmail. That's over a threat to pack the Supreme Court if the court rules to limit abortion rights. Cotton leveled the charge in a single word tweet this week, linking to an article from The Hill. It says blackmail. Republican Senator Steve Daines also commented, tweeting, not surprised, called it. The Hill article quotes Democrat Senator Richard Blumenthal saying that overturning or limiting Roe v. Wade will fuel momentum to make changes to the court. The Supreme Court decided to hear a case involving a Mississippi law that restricts abortion after 15 weeks. The court could use the case to overturn Roe v. Wade or open the door to further restrictions on abortion. Some Democrat politicians like Congressman Gerald Nadler and Senator Ed Markey say they want to add four members to the court to take back the majority. But there does not appear to be enough votes for that. Blumenthal says that even if the court isn't expanded, other changes could be made, including changing the court's jurisdiction or requiring a certain number of votes to overturn precedents. Democrat Senator Sheldon Whitehouse is also quoted in the Hill article. He says a commission to examine the Supreme Court, created by President Biden's executive order, is looking at a number of options for reforming the court. The court ruling in the Mississippi case could also impact midterm elections. The court is expected to hear the case this fall and issue a ruling in the spring of 2022. The Justice Department releases part of a legal memorandum. It helped then-Attorney General William Barr decide whether to prosecute former President Trump during the Mueller investigation. The issue in this case is whether the department could keep portions of the internal memo hidden from the public. The federal court ordered that the memo be disclosed in full, and the Justice Department has released the first page and one section of it. The department said it would continue its efforts to keep the remainder of the document hidden. The newly released section shows how top officials made the argument for a public determination on whether to prosecute Trump for obstruction of justice. In 2019, Barr announced that Mueller did not provide sufficient evidence to support a case against Trump. A federal judge in Texas sided with a cafe owner who was suing the Small Business Association for prioritizing relief money based on race and gender. But in what situations can these race-based considerations stay in line with the Constitution? NTD's Christina Kim has that story. Cafe owner Philip Greer is likely to succeed in his lawsuit against the Small Business Association. That's what U.S. District Judge Reed O'Connor says. The Biden administration issued a directive that prioritizes pandemic relief funds to restaurants that are owned by women, veterans, and people considered socially and economically disadvantaged, referring to Native Americans, Blacks, Latinos, and Asians. For the first 21 days, the SBA is only processing applications from this group. Proponents say these now-prioritized groups have faced systemic discrimination, and these programs help address these issues and create more equity. But Greer, who is white, is arguing that the policy actively excludes entire classes of Americans not mentioned in the priority group who are also suffering significant financial losses caused by the pandemic. He reportedly lost $100,000 during this time. And according to the SBA, the priority group requested a total of $29 billion in funds as of mid-May. The Restaurant Revitalization Fund only has $28.6 billion, meaning there isn't enough money left for Greer. Legal analyst John Malcolm says these race-based classifications must be under strict scrutiny. That means that the government has to demonstrate that they have a compelling interest uh, in coming up with a law that, it, that makes racial classifications and that the law is narrowly tailored 
to achieve that compelling uh, interest. But he says the government needs to prove this interest per industry. And according to the judge, the SBA hasn't demonstrated there was discrimination in the restaurant industry that would justify this. So the question seems to remain. Can the U.S. government tell some people they have to wait for help because of their race or gender? Malcolm says there will be plenty of instances these issues will be challenged, especially under the Biden administration. The Supreme Court has obviously considered race-based classifications in a variety of areas, uh, including government contracting, uh, laws providing funds such as this restaurant revitalization fund. They've obviously considered racial preferences in admissions uh, schemes at colleges and universities. And the law is unsettled uh, in that area. Malcolm says ultimately these programs discriminate based on race and that this issue could use further clarification from the courts. Christina Kim, NTD News. Alabama Governor Kay Ivey signed two election reform bills into law yesterday. One law is to clean up the voting rolls and another bans curbside voting. Ivey praised the bills in a statement saying, our freedom of speech is rooted in our ability to vote and a strong election process is what sets our democracy apart from every other country in the world. She says she appreciates that the bills are bipartisan. A Democrat representative introduced the bill that revises the process of updating voter address changes and improves the accuracy of voter rolls. As for curbside voting, advocates say it makes voting accessible for elderly and disabled voters. Critics say it makes it easier to cheat. The new laws will take effect immediately. Coming up, with the 20-year anniversary of September 11th only a few months away, a patriotic artist unveils his latest public art installation. It's a tribute to the first responders at 9-11. And the Navy Blue Angels perform aerial stunts over the U.S. Naval Academy's commissioning week. It's in the lead-up to the school's graduation ceremony. More on that here on NTD News. The Texas House passes a bill requiring professional sports teams to play the national anthem before games start. Clubs that don't comply risk losing massive tax subsidies. The bill now awaits the signature of Texas Governor Greg Abbott. The bill was a response to Dallas' NBA team and their decision not to play the Star Spangled Banner. The NBA later required the national anthem be played before all games. Democrats in the state house called the bill unconstitutional. Democrat State Representative Julie Johnson says that the bill would infringe upon freedom of speech. Republican Dustin Burroughs says that's not the case. Since teams can choose not to play the anthem, it's just that they will forfeit tax breaks. The bill would take effect on September 1st if Abbott signed it into law. Comedian and activist Jon Stewart joins several congressmen at the nation's capital. He's there to push for more care for veterans who suffered toxic exposure while serving in the military. NTD's Don Tran has the details. Famous comedian Jon Stewart broke from his usual routine at Washington, D.C., lending his voice to saying military veterans who suffered toxic exposure to airborne hazards should get more care. But the former Daily Show host did spare some time to crack a few jokes. Today really reminds us to give a hat tip to our founding fathers who in their infinite wisdom looked around our majestic country and all the temperate climates and thought to build the capital in a humid, fetid swamp. According to the Department of Veterans Affairs, burn pits were commonly used in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other areas of the Southwest Asia theater for military operations. Burn pits are areas where people burn waste in the open air. It increases exposure to toxic fumes. The proposed legislation will establish a service connection for nearly two dozen respiratory illnesses and provide health care for potentially as many as 3.5 million veterans. Defense contractors can't view the U.S. Congress as Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, while veterans are back there like Oliver with a bowl of gruel asking, please, sir, may I have some more? Stewart also said we need to presume various negative effects like cancers or respiratory illnesses are occurring among veterans who have been exposed to toxic fumes. Representative Mark Takano, who was also at the event, said the need to reform and overhaul the entire process so Veterans Affairs can provide support to veterans without the need for continued congressional intervention. Don Tran, NTD News. 
Staten Island artist Scott Labato unveils his latest memorial tribute to the first responders of 9-11. He says it's meant to take people away from the daily chaos and bring about unity in divided times. NTD's Jason Perry has more from Staten Island. A full crowd showed up to see what artist Scott Labato had up his sleeve, or what was under this covering. Police and firemen were also in attendance and part of the adjacent road was blocked off. The crowd waited patiently. Labato quickly made minor adjustments to the artwork and started a smoke machine before playing the solemn music. Then the artist and two others slowly pulled back the tarp, revealing one firefighter and one policeman, both on their knees with their arms around each other. One guest said it brought a tear to her eye. It's really touching, very touching. This is like what I call an action piece. It's action art because you can actually feel as if you were at the World Trade Center site once it imploded. Leticia Romero, who is running for Staten Island Borough President, said the artwork evoked the unity felt throughout America after 9-11. We could feel America's support across the nation. That's what Scott has brought in this image. Never forget, remember the unity. Firefighter, police, you know, everyone came together on that day and it was beautiful. Lebedo mentioned that this year will be the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Remember the day after 9-11? Everybody was like this. Maybe hopefully this will make people think for the next week or something, or month, that, yeah, we can all be crazy, but remember that day after 9-11. As painful it was, but how united we were. Scott Lebedo just unveiled his latest tribute to the first responders on 9-11 in May. He released it early because he wanted to bring people together due to the division within the country. Jason Perry, NTD News, New York. The Navy Blue Angels flying team performed over Annapolis, Maryland. It's part of the U.S. Naval Academy's Commissioning Week activities. Pilots soared overhead doing tricks and flying in fantastic formations, while service members performed music and drills on the ground. The Blue Angels represent the Navy and Marine Corps in yearly shows. The team has 140 members and this year marks their 75th year. The performance was held with safety restrictions for the viewing audience in place. Stadium views was limited, but other Annapolis locations also provided lo viewing. And cruises were selling tickets to people looking to observe the show from the water. The commissioning week activities led to Naval Academy graduation, where the Blue Angels will return to fly over the ceremony. Just ahead, critics in Washington, D.C. are crying foul following Amazon's merger announcement. The shopping giant plans to purchase MGM Studios, but some say the acquisition violates antitrust laws. An environmental nonprofit and several federal agencies step in to help oyster farmers. The industry hopes to recover the, as the pandemic fades. All that and more in just a minute. If your vehicle's manufacturer warranty is expired or is about to run out, you'll be on the hook for unexpected repairs. Breakdowns used to mean paying thousands out of pocket. Until now. Introducing Endurance Advantage, a vehicle protection plan with extensive breakdown coverage plus routine maintenance. As a mechanic, I see it all the time. A customer doesn't keep up with their regular maintenance and it leads to a breakdown or worse, disqualifies their warranty. No matter how many miles your car has, if it's under 20 years old, Endurance has you covered. That means insurance plus Endurance equals total protection. From oil and filter changes to brake pad and wiper blade replacements, Advantage provides maintenance coverage up to $3,500 per year. With Endurance Advantage, you'll never worry about paying for covered auto repairs or regular maintenance again. Call 800-574-6805. For a free quote, that's 800-574-6805. Hi folks, Joe Namath here, and if you're on Medicare, this is important. You're now entitled to eliminate co-pays and get dental care, dentures, eyeglasses, prescription coverage, in-home aids, unlimited transportation, and home-delivered meals, all at no additional cost. Plus, your zip code may have coverage with the give back benefit that adds money back to your Social Security check every month. I call to get dental, transportation, meals, and the give back benefit. With this virus situation, 
I called to get everything I'm entitled to. I couldn't believe I was missing out on so many benefits. With the uncertainty of the virus, you need to get everything you're entitled to. Millions of people have trusted the Medicare coverage helpline. You can too. Call now. It's free. Call 1-800-764-1930. That's 1-800-764-1930 now. Pacific Gas and Electric will pay $43.4 million to government agencies in three northern California counties. It's to cover bills from wildfires ignited during the past two years. The settlements announced Wednesday will cover some of the costs incurred by 10 government agencies during the Kincaid Fire from 2019 and the Zog Fire from 2020. The three counties are part of a sprawling territory where PG&E provides electricity to about 16 million people. The company's crumbling equipment and power lines that come into contact with vegetation are seen as the source of the fires. The company's long-neglected power grid has caused issues over the years. PG&E still faces 33 criminal charges of inadvertently injuring six firefighters. The company denies wrongdoing. We have an update on the murder trial involving the abduction and stabbing of a University of Iowa student. On Wednesday, the defendant claimed for the first time that two masked men were responsible for the crime and forced him to take part in it. Christian Bahena Rivera faces trial for first-degree murder. In a surprise move, the defense called him up to the witness stand. Rivera said two armed men showed up at his trailer that evening. After you took a shower, uh, what did you do? I left the bathroom. What did you see? Two people in my living room. Those two people in your living room, how were they dressed? With sweaters and their faces covered. Rivera said the men told him to get into his car and drive. And he said they passed by Molly Tibbetts as she was jogging, and then they directed him to stop. Rivera admitted that it was his black car caught on camera circling Tibbetts in Brooklyn, Iowa on July 18, 2018. He also admitted that she ended up in his car's trunk and that he was the one to hide her body in a cornfield. But he said one of the men left his car with a knife and walked down a rural road. Rivera claimed he was gone for about 10 minutes, with the other man staying in the car quiet. Did you hear him say anything? Uh, well, um, you could hear a lot of things, uh, but uh, I guess what I heard him saying is, uh, come on, Jack. Rivera said he didn't know who the two men were. The defendant's lawyers tried to look into Tibbetts' boyfriend, Dalton Jack, but police say they cleared Jack as a suspect. That's because he was out of town for work that day. Rivera said the men loaded Tibbetts' body into the trunk and directed him to drive several miles. Then they told him to turn off the car, wait a few minutes, and leave. Before uh, they leave, one of them tells me not to say anything about what had happened. Que ellos conocían a Iris y conocían a mi hija. That they knew Iris and that they knew my daughter. Que si decía algo, ellos se iban a encargar de ellas. That if I said something, they would take care of them. He said the men took off on foot and he never saw them again. And then he said he opened the trunk a few minutes later to carry Tibbet's body off to a cornfield. And Rivera acknowledged that he wasn't telling the truth in 2018 when detectives asked him about Tibbet's disappearance. At that time, Rivera said he approached Tibbetts while she was running, and she threatened to call the police on him. They fought, and then he blacked out. Rivera's testimony in his own defense came as a surprise to most legal experts. Kevin Hogan, NTD News. Critics in Washington are zooming in on Amazon's move to buy MGM Studios. They're raising concerns about a possible monopoly, though experts suggest the deal poses few antitrust risks. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. A little more than an hour after the deal was announced, Republican Senator Josh Hawley called Amazon.com a monopoly on Twitter, and Democratic Senator Amy Klobuchar, who chairs the Senate's antitrust panel, called for, quote, a thorough investigation to ensure that this deal won't risk harming competition. The announcement comes just one day after Washington, D.C.'s Attorney General filed an antitrust lawsuit against the shopping giant. 
now I think a lot of the players in the space are trying to catch up to the bigger players, to the Netflixes, to the Disneys. And you have to spend money in order to play. You have to spend money to compete with these behemoths. Um, and so I think that's why you're seeing companies like Warner Media and Discovery come together, sort of beef up their content arsenal so that they can compete. The suit alleges the online retailer broke antitrust law with unfair pricing strategies. The $8.45 billion merger would combine the world's biggest online retailer with an iconic film and TV studio. MGM owns the James Bond franchise and hit TV series The Handmaid's Tale. That's on top of classic films like the Rocky series and Princess Bride. But according to Box Office Mojo, MGM and Amazon are absent from the top 10 grossing films list of 2018 and 2019. All we can speculate now is that Bezos really wants to be in the Hollywood game, and this is sort of his first big step to becoming a competitive force in it. Amazon's Prime Video also faces well-financed rivals including Netflix, HBO Max, and Apple TV+. Given the state of competition in the two markets, antitrust agencies would likely struggle to convince a court that the deal will mean higher prices or less innovation. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Good news for travelers, cruising is coming back to the U.S. next month. Celebrity Cruise Lines has been cleared to sail from Fort Lauderdale in Florida in June. The company's inaugural post-pandemic journey departs June 26th on the Celebrity Edge. It's not yet known what the ports of call will serve. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention requires all cruise lines to complete trial cruises that replicate real-world conditions or require 95% of the passengers and crew to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Celebrity has opted to require vaccination proof for all crew and passengers over 16 years old. The restart comes as other cruise companies take issue with that rule. Norwegian Cruise Lines threatened to pull out of Florida earlier this month due to the state's law blocking businesses from requiring proof of vaccination. A federal judge ordered CDC and Florida state officials to try to resolve that matter in mediation earlier this week. Oyster farmers are working to keep their heads above water after a year of restaurant closures left them facing hard times. But one conservation group and several federal agencies are stepping in to help them and the environment. These New England oyster farmers are making money by dumping the shellfish back into the ocean instead of selling them to restaurants. It's a new survival strategy for farmers who panicked as they watched restaurant closures rock the economy. The farmers feared that unsold oysters would grow too large for the lucrative raw bar market. But a conservation group and several federal agencies came up with a creative idea to save the industry. They're buying millions of surplus oversized oysters, known as the uglies, and releasing them onto depleted coastal reefs. The plan will help reconstruct key marine habitats. At the Nature Conservancy, we do oyster restoration to replace ecosystem services that are lost. And we typically will raise oysters and deploy them in the estuary to give the, the estuary kind of a jump start um, to become healthy again. The program is called Supporting Oyster Aquaculture and Restoration, or SOAR for short. The initiative seeks to rejuvenate coastal reefs at 20 locations in New England, the Mid-Atlantic, and Washington State. The Nature Conservancy is spending $2 million to buy 5 million surplus oysters to release on these reefs. The initiative benefits both farmers and the environment. Oversized oysters have been removed from farmers' growing cages, making the precious space available again. Farmers can now use that real estate to raise larger amounts of smaller shellfish. The problem is that as these oysters grow, if they get too big, they outgrow that market, the, the half shell market, which is which on our market here. And once they get, you know, four or five inches, and this one's a little misshapen, what we would call an ugly, um, we won't really have a big market for them. The oyster reefs also provide critical habitat for fish and help protect shorelines from erosion. The oversized overstock oysters can also filter out larger volumes of pollutants and excess nutrients from the water than smaller shellfish. Andrew Thomas, MTD News. Up next, WWE star and actor John Cena is accused of kowtowing to the Chinese Communist Party. That's because he apologized to Chinese fans for calling Taiwan a country, but a Hollywood producer says it's part of a much bigger systemic issue and the annual flood season is arriving in China. In South China alone, almost 80 rivers exceed flood warning levels. That and more on NTD News.
athlete and actor John Cena is facing backlash for apologizing to his Chinese fans for calling Taiwan a country. Many Americans are outraged, accusing him of appeasing the Chinese Communist Party for access to the China market. But a Hollywood producer says it's part of a bigger systemic issue that no one actor can fix and that there's only one way to solve it. Here are the details. John Cena is best known as a WWE star. He's also an actor and one that speaks Chinese, as many people found out for the first time on Tuesday. After he issued this on-camera apology in Mandarin to his Chinese fans. His mistake? Referring to Taiwan as a country. In the eyes of the Chinese Communist Party, it's part of mainland China. And saying otherwise will get you in a whole lot of trouble. Here's his apology. This comes as Cena's latest film, Fast and Furious 9, hits movie theaters in China. But he's receiving a lot of backlash for his apology, as many Americans view it as yet another celebrity kowtowing to the CCP for the sake of monetary gain. The criticism is 100% warranted. Whether he should be the target of it all, um, I do disagree with. Chris Fenton is the former president of DMG Entertainment Motion Picture Group, and for about two decades, he worked on some of the biggest blockbuster movies. He also authored the book Feeding the Dragon, Inside the Trillion Dollar Dilemma Facing Hollywood, the NBA, and American Business. Fenton knows all about what it's like to deal with the Chinese regime in order to access the China market. It was part of his job for many years. As for Cena's apology, Fenton says he believes Cena was just complying with his contract. And he says if Cena came out and stood by his Taiwan statement, he would just be replaced by another actor. So the problem needs to be solved at its root. I really don't think he wanted to step into this controversy, but he did. And we need to use this as a catalyst to fix things. He says no one actor or individual can fix this issue because the problem is systemic and not just limited to Hollywood, but businesses worldwide. Cena may be the catalyst, but Fenton says for real change to happen, the entertainment industry must rally behind Cena. And hopefully us leading by example as the Hollywood community can then spread such a pushback and such a solidarity movement to help other companies that are also accessing the China market to rebalance and disrupt the relationship that they have with China right now that needs to be rectified. He says not only does Hollywood need to unite behind Cena, but the whole of America and the Western world needs to put aside their differences and come together to push back against the Chinese Communist Party. UK trade has shifted. China is now the UK's biggest importer, replacing Germany. NTD's Patrick Hayden breaks it down. China is now the biggest importer into the UK. It replaces Germany. The Office of National Statistics, or ONS, says from 2018 to the first quarter of this year, goods imported from China rose 66 percent. That's an increase of nearly 17 billion pounds. In the same period, German imports dropped by about a quarter to 12 and a half billion pounds. The pandemic increased the demand for Chinese goods like PPE. And last year, China imported more electrical devices and clothing into the UK. China was the first major economy to see growth during 2020. EU trade was also disrupted due to Brexit. The ONS says German imports to the UK started to fall back in April 2019. Germany's motor industry has also slumped since the pandemic led to fewer imports. Patrick Hayden, NTD News London. Chinese authorities are proposing a $150,000 compensation for each victim of the deadly ultra-marathon race, but only half of the victim's families are accepting this offer. NTD's Tiffany Meyer brings us more on the story. More updates on the deadly ultra-marathon race in China. Some victims' families are refusing authorities' compensation proposals. Beijing remained silent for the first two days after the tragedy and only responded following the public outcry. They asked provincial authorities to thoroughly investigate the incident. 
Chinese media reported local authorities proposed a compensation of $150,000 for each victim's family, including $80,000 of insurance money. And the lump sum compensation will be final. The mayor of the city where the race took place said on Tuesday that over half of the families agreed to sign. Local media reported some of the families that refused to sign think the compensation is too little. A family member also pointed out that this was not a natural disaster, but rather a man-made tragedy. The person seems to indicate that people responsible for it haven't been held accountable. Many Chinese netizens questioned how authorities are dealing with the issue. One wrote, they don't allow the victim's families to contact each other and even audio record the visits. They want to separate people, pay compensation and get it done. It's all rotten. Another netizen says this is the CCP's long-adopted method to divide and conquer the people. 21 runners died during the ultra-marathon race on Saturday. That's over 10 percent of participants. Organizers blamed the extreme weather conditions, but details about the event revealed that the lack of contingency planning has more to do with the tragedy. According to Chinese media, hours after the race started, several runners suffered from physical discomfort and low body temperatures. One of them called for help, but the rescue team didn't arrive until two hours later. Local media cited experts saying that the tragedy may have to do with the fact that rescuers were not on site quickly enough. Another survivor told Chinese media as he gave up the running and went down the mountain, he phoned for help more than 40 times, but didn't get any clear guidance. A local shepherd named Zhu Keming rescued six runners during the ultra-marathon race. But he is changing his narrative when a major Chinese state-owned media interviewed him. Zhu was in his cave shelter when he heard cries for help from outside. There was a rainstorm and he soon discovered the athletes, brought them to shelter and lit a fire. He told Chinese state-run media CCTV on Tuesday, That kind of weather is rare, very rare. But just a day before that, he told a local media in an interview, This kind of weather comes very often. There are often such extreme weather conditions. Based on Zhu's account, many Chinese netizens condemned the race's organizers for being unprepared for the extreme weather conditions. But following Zhu's interview with CCTV, netizens can no longer fight Zhu's initial interview with the local media. Netizens are commenting on this abrupt change. A netizen says sarcastically, because this weather is very rare, the shepherd just happened to dig a rain shelter cave and happened to stock some firewood. See, what a coincidence it is. Another netizen says communist China is a country with lies everywhere. China's flood season is already kicking in this year and fast. The reports are bringing back fears from 2020 when floods left much of the country in a state of crisis. Nearly 80 rivers in southern China have surpassed the flood warning levels. Videos circulating on social media show cars submerged in several feet of water across multiple areas. China's biggest river, the Yangtze River, is also becoming a cause for concern. On Wednesday, water levels in multiple sections of the river had reached at least seven feet higher than records from the same time last year, and it's still on the rise. To prepare for possible flooding, local authorities ordered an emergency response plan and wartime flood control measures. It is a status similar to what's called a state of emergency in the U.S. Last year, massive flooding caused major damages across the country. Floodwaters submerged over 20,000 square miles of farmland. The crisis also caused over $20 billion worth of economic damage. Chinese authorities are now gearing up once again for major flooding in the upcoming months. Farmers and conservationists in Switzerland build fences to protect livestock from wolves. About 100 of the predators roam the country for prey. When the game's over and it's time to go home, sometimes your car has other plans. That's why I drive with CarShield. As expensive as car repairs can be, I wanted the best defense around. And with CarShield's administrators, they make sure that you don't get stuck with expensive car repairs like this. Did I forget to mention that with CarShield's network, I also get 24-7 roadside assistance, towing, and rental car reimbursement included. 
That's peace of mind every driver needs. I saved close to $9,000. If it wasn't for car shields, I wouldn't have my car. I gotta tell you, it's quite a relief not to worry about expensive car breakdowns anymore. And with Car Shields administrators, you can choose your favorite mechanic or dealer to do the work. Plus, it's easier than ever to get America's favorite car protection. There's no long-term contracts, and coverage is affordable for every wallet size. If I didn't have Car Shield, I would have been out of pocket $7,000. And as a parent of three, I couldn't have that. I trust Car Shield administrators because they paid my claim. Talk about MVP protection for less than the cost of a ball game. Take it from me, the boomer. Nobody wants to go through the headache of an expensive car breakdown on their own. If you're driving without a warranty, you have to call Car Shield. Yeah, you do. So do yourself and your car a favor. Call Car Shield. They're your best line of defense against expensive breakdowns. Car Shield administrators paid almost $4,000 for my repairs. Car Shield is wonderful. They saved me $1,300. With Car Shield, I saved $4,100 on my first repair. Over a million happy drivers couldn't be wrong. Call Car Shield now. Protect yourself now against expensive auto repair bills. Call Car Shield for a free and instant protection plan quote. Once your car breaks down, it's too late. Call 1 800 862 2990. That's 1 800 862 2990. 1 800 862 2990. In France, some are speaking out against the mask mandate for children. According to experts, seven months after the measure was implemented, no study was conducted that could back up its effectiveness, while more children are showing signs of mental health issues. NTD's David Vives met with a lawyer and a psychiatrist who addresses the issue. The French Academy of Medicine on one state stated its support for mandatory vaccination of children. While the National Health Authority hasn't advocated for this yet, another measure continues to raise questions, the mandatory wearing of masks by children. In the words of this psychiatrist, students between 7 to 11 years old have showed very concerning signs of mental health issues due to the mandatory measures, including mask wearing. Children between 7 to 11 usually make friends and are in the process of learning at school. We are seeing more of them who are not able to learn, memorize, and they're also experiencing somatization. They haven't seen the face of their teacher for months. A part of their humanity seems to have gone. French health authorities based their mask policy on WHO guidelines, which recommends children over 5 years old to wear masks while considering certain factors. But after seven months of mandatory masking for children, some questions of its effectiveness remain unanswered. Lawyer Clarisse Sand addressed the Council of State, the highest court in France, with a legal request to remove the mandatory wearing of masks for children. She said she has medical evidence that shows masks harm children at some extent. About children's wear of masks, we have one year of hindsight and study conducted by psychiatrists and parents, doctors, epidemiologists. They disagree with this mandatory act. But she said the Council of State declined her request on May 25th. The Council quote the WHO terms to justify its decision to impose the wearing of masks on children. In other words, it's not even possible to debate the merits of the measure. The Council of State just replied to us saying that's what the WHO advised, and that's the end of it. So eventually we will bring in new elements, but the debate was never open in the first place. She also said the decision of the government has not been backed by any study since the moment the mask mandate was imposed on children. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. Carlos Ghosn went from top car executive to an international fugitive on Interpol's most wanted list. As he prepares for a visit from French investigators, he spoke to the Associated Press on his legal troubles, his escape from Japan, and his new life in Lebanon. A year and a half after his escape from Japan to Lebanon, former car magnate Carlos Ghosn wants to clear his name. He contends he's the victim of a corporate coup. Obviously, I've been the object of a character assassination campaign, uh, frankly, massive, led by, obviously, Nissan with the prosecutor and the complicity of the Japanese government. Gon was arrested in Japan in November 2018 on accusations of financial misconduct. 
It was a stunning downfall of an executive seen as visionary. Ghosn denies accusations of under-reporting his compensation and misusing company funds. In late 2019, he skipped his £10 million bail, fleeing house arrest in a Hollywood-style caper. According to officials, he hid in a box stashed in the hold of a Turkey-bound private jet. He says he fled after it became clear he would have zero chances of a fair trial. He's now an international fugitive on Interpol's most wanted list. Several associates are on or awaiting trial in Japan in cases related to his financial activities or escape. I feel uh, empathy and compassion for them because I was in the same, I was in the same situation and I know what kind of beast they are facing uh, now. This hostage justice system is brutal and needs to be denounced. His arrest drew international scrutiny and criticism of Japan's legal system and its 99% conviction rate. Ghosn was kept in solitary confinement for months without being allowed to speak with his wife. He says he's now enjoying the slower pace of life in self-imposed exile in his native Lebanon. It's like you have, you know, I don't know, a heart attack somewhere or you've been hit by a bus. You change life. All of a sudden, you are in a completely different reality and you have to adapt to this reality. He now faces legal challenges in France after the Japanese accusations triggered scrutiny of his activities there. French investigators will question him next week in Beirut. Ghosn says the meetings are voluntary and he's eager to tell his side of the story. City dwellers are learning how to keep wolves at bay in the mountains of eastern Switzerland. The effort is helping keep sheep and goat farmers protect their flocks. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. Around 100 wolves roam wild through Switzerland's countryside, and their numbers are rising. There was a referendum last year on whether to make it easier to shoot wolves deemed a threat to livestock. The initiative exposed divergent attitudes towards the animals from urban and rural voters. The pro-conservation side won, but some people from both sides of the divide are now working together to manage the animal's threat. Under a program called Pastors Voluntaris, or Voluntary Shepherds, city dwellers learn practical skills, like putting up electrified fences to keep sheep in and wolves out. Yes, in Switzerland sometimes the wolf is a little bit a difficult subject. We have a lot of experts, like everyone knows something, and I decided to come here and to see how it really is. Sommerer was one of 17 volunteers on a recent volunteer weekend. There. She picked up tips like how to avoid making sharp corners in a fence where animals might get trapped. Marcus Berther helped instruct the lessons and shared his experience tending to 190 sheep and 100 lambs on his farm. I think if it continues like this, we will have to eliminate the wolves who cause problems. It would be nearly impossible to defend the herd. As soon as the wolf starts to jump over the fence, then we farmers no longer have a chance. The project is helping both farmers and conservationists gain a better understanding of the problem, though the wolf shouldn't be underestimated. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. A special treat for stargazers this week, a huge supermoon lit up the sky above a Spanish port town on Wednesday. The Old Farmer's Almanac says it's the closest full moon to the Earth of the year, giving it the title of supermoon and making it look bigger and brighter. Moons were often given their names by Native American tribes and based on events in nature. May's moon is named the Flower Moon after the abundant flowers that bloom across North America in May. And that's all for now. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. I'm Kevin Hogan.
have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source.